uh, who are woken up early. Um, like the announcement just said, we'll be recording this webinar. Um, in case uh, you have any questions or concerns about it, please let me know. Um, I will just quickly introduce the workshop myself and uh, do a bit of housekeeping as to what the rules of engagement are here, and then we can begin. My name is Pruti Sharada. My pronouns are she and her. I am the South Asia Communications Consultant, and I also lead the communications for the EHP campaign at Equality Now. That's the End Harmful Practices. So all our advocacy, knowledge products, uh, work that we do to end FGMC along with child marriage and other um, um, harmful practices comes under this campaign. Um, we are very excited and happy today because we have been trying to spotlight Asia as um, uh, a region of concern for FGMC advocacy and especially the critical role media can play in helping the movement here. So um, this is a culmination of a long planned workshop. So we are very happy that you're here. Uh, just a few basic things. Uh, we request you to keep uh, yourself muted so that none of the speakers are disturbed. Uh, the Q&A and the chat sections both are open. So please feel free to be as interactive as possible because uh, though I happen to mention it as a webinar, it's actually a workshop. So we want it to be as discussion-based as possible. Uh, we want to re-emphasize that our aim is, like I said, to highlight how critical the media is when it comes to ending FGMC in Asia and also um, how critical it is for us to understand what the challenges are that you face when it comes to covering FGMC. Uh, we're hoping to have that discussion here. Please be open, uh, but I also request please be sensitive because it is a very sensitive subject. So um, please um, mind your language, mind how you present uh, your doubts and concerns. Uh, we have a wonderful list of panelists. Hopefully you've been able to go through the agenda and we can begin. Um, today I am joined by Stella. She is my colleague. She will be looking at the tech side of things. Hopefully no power cuts, no tech problems, and we'll have a smooth go of things. So let's get started. Um, our first speaker is Ria. Uh, what I will be doing is giving you a brief introduction of our speakers, handing it over to them, and the more detailed uh, bio of theirs would be in the chat if you want to refer to that. So Priya, welcome. Priya Goswami is the co-founder of Sahio, which is India's pioneering nonprofit organization building the FGMC uh, movement in India ground up. Yeah. Founder and CEO of the Mumkin app, which is aimed at using technology for survivors of gender based violence. And she is the recipient of a National Film Award for her documentary, A Pinch of Skin, the first documentary from India to speak about the practice of FGMC. She will be speaking on FGMC, understanding the basics and the global movement to end this harmful practice. Priya, over to you. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for the introduction, Shruti. Um, I'm very, very excited to speak uh, in this workshop because this has been a long cherished goal of mine to uh, address the media on how media can impact the movement of FGMC, specifically in reference to how it can impact the movement uh, and awareness of uh, prevalence of FGMC in Asia. With that goal in mind, my name is Priya. My pronouns are she and her. I'd be more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, and I hope to make this a very, very interactive conversation between you and I. Uh, to begin with, just a few basics on what is FGMC and what do we know about it so far? Um, First and foremost, uh, FGMC or female genital cutting and mutilation is truly a global phenomenon. Um, official data states that it is prevalent in 92 countries, but I say this with asterisks because we still don't know how many countries are affected by FGMC. Um, there are three uh, types of uh, three to four types of FGMC that we know of, uh, but the way we define FGMC in medical anatomical terms is that it is partial or complete 
removal of female genitalia. At this point, I would also like to say a trigger warning. If at any points you feel like um, this conversation is getting too heavy for you and you feel like just, you know, getting out and then coming back in, uh, please feel free to do uh, so. The conversation will be um, respectful, yes, but also graphic. And now back to what is female genital cutting slash mutilation. So activists around the globe have rallied for decades for this to be recognized as, as Shruti said, a harmful practice, a social norm which has its roots uh, in basically the fear of female body and sexuality. And it has been passed on as a story, a very well to uh, told story from generation to generation. Um, if you want to know on what are the different types of FGMC. In my presentation, I'll also detail on what is type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4. For now, um, what we need to know is that FGMC prevalent in Asia, um, more often than not, is type 1, which is total or partial removal of the clitoris or the clitoral hood. Um, again, I say this with asterisks because uh, FGMC in Asia is um, Basically, still, still, the knowledge of the prevalence of FGMC in Asia is still in its nascent stage. We are all um, figuring things out and finding more about it as we go along. Um, another very important thing to know about it um, officially is that it is said to be prevalent in 92 countries. Um, now, again, as I said, that it is not probably the full picture. Uh, UN estimates that about 200 million women are affected worldwide. Again, that is official data. So we are still finding out how many con uh, communities actually practice it in India alone, let alone speaking of Asia. And um, basically emphasizing on the fact that it is a harmful tradition, a social norm, which has its roots in every community telling a great story uh, to their, uh, you know, generation after generation to perpetuate this uh, practice. Um, what are some of the efforts that have been uh, put together to end FGMC? Um, of course, uh, my organization, Sayu, is one of the pioneering organizations in India, which came together. I'm the only co-founder who is not from the community. Everyone else is from the community, which says that we have created a ground-up movement. Um, and uh, there is a lot of uh, emphasis on storytelling, collaboration, and education when it comes to uh, talking about FGMC, because uh, first and foremost, it is a practice uh, which the community wholeheartedly believes in, believes that it is a rite of passage for a woman to undergo FGMC. And uh, that is where our role comes in as media practitioners as to how can we um, build discourse or narrative around this hardcore belief that FGMC is a rite of passage for a woman. Um, over the next uh, few presentations, we'll learn more about different countries that practice FGMC, uh, how is it seen um, in their community culturally, and then we'll come back to some of the good uh, practices on reporting on FGMC. All right, passing it over to you, uh, Shruti. Thank you so much, Priya. Um, would you uh, like to also highlight what the global nature of FGMC is, though we are specifically speaking about FGMC in Asia, but um, it is definitely a global movement and also the end FGMC movement is also global. So would you um, give us a bit of um, a highlight of that? Absolutely. So one of the things that we often encounter while working on FGMC is that everyone believes it is an African problem, right? I'm sure everyone joining us have already heard this. Oh, FGMC, female genital mutilation or cutting is an African problem. But I think what activists around the globe, including us, um, FGMC activists in Asia are trying to do is that we are truly trying to establish that FGMC is a global problem. As you can see in the map out there, um, Shruti or Stella, could you please highlight the map or make it full screen? Thank you. Um, as you can see, this is a great map by Equality Now. You can see by the color coding of it as to what is the prevalence uh, rate in these countries. Um, the ones affected by um, the darkest uh, purple, that's category one, uh, which is like the highest concentration of FGMC cases known and documented. 
followed by the color schema. If you're interested in this map, uh, please get in touch with us. We'd be more than happy to share. At this point, I would also point out that there's a lot of, um, for a lack of a better word, incomplete information on how many countries actually practice FGMC. There's a conflicting resource. Um, there's a dissonance. For example, in uh, if you go to the UNICEF or United Nations website, it presents uh, the information of 31 countries uh, practicing FGMC, which is not the complete picture. Um, and here, I would also like to point out that not all countries practicing FGMC are type one practicing FGMC. Type one, as we know, is um, removal of total or partial removal of the clitoral hood or clitoris, which is known to be practiced or prevalent in Asia. Um, type two is further severe, as we will learn in our um, presentations further. Type three is complete removal. Uh, type four is involved stitching or um, cutting uh, the parts of labia, so on and so forth. So I think there is a kind of a, um, we need to approach this with a finer brush when we think about FGMC and its prevalence all over the world. Not all countries affected by FGMC would have um, a similar type of FGMC prevalent, which is also one of the reasons why it may or may not be documented. Um, many countries which are affected by FGMC, many communities that practice FGMC um, believe that they are not cutting the female genitalia because they are only cutting uh, the clitoral hood or only removing a pinch of skin from the clitoris. Um, so again, this is one of the dissonances that we would get into um, as we approach our presentation. Um, and yeah, this is a very incredible resource to have. As you know, the, this map is a very incredible uh, resource to look at to see how expansive the prevalence of FGMC really is. Thank and you that, so much. And again, yeah. I say, uh, yeah. is not the full picture. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even uh, what we see here today, um, as Priya said rightly, um, is not the full picture. And also FGMC in Asia remains not very well understood. Uh, data and evidence and um, a lot of supporting um, information is still not available. Our panelists and speakers, um, as they come up, will speak about that. Uh, thank you so much, Priya. Thank you for highlighting how it is a global concern. Of course, today we are speaking about Asia specifically because we feel the spotlight is not there enough when it comes to this region. Um, and as Priya highlighted, it's not a monolithic problem. Uh, the countries who practice it within Asia uh, will have different cultures, different traditions, different beliefs um, connected to the practice. Uh, there will also be different types of FGMC that will be practiced. So the resources that you see here, we, we are more than happy to share. I'll be sharing the links in the chat. So Equality Now, where, where this map comes from, um, has a report uh, which provides a global picture of FGMC. And you can, of course, also get an Asian picture. Uh, we will also share um, resources that uh, Priya mentioned from Sayu. So uh, let's move on. Uh, we have... Uh, our next speaker, who is Naz. I will quickly introduce her and then she could go. Naz is a lawyer by training with a background in human rights. For the last nine years, she has shaped her career in the NGO sector, working on various human rights issues, particularly on issues faced by women and girls, including those with disabilities. Originally from Bangladesh, Naz is currently based in Malaysia. She will present an Asia overview and the need for more government action in the region. Naz, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Shruti. Yes, so um, from Priya, actually, we get like an overall understanding um, of what FGMC entails. Um, so FGMC, as we understand so far, it's a harmful traditional practice, right, which involves um, partial or total removal of the external female genitalia or causing other injury to the female genital organs for non-medical reasons. And Priya has already given us, you know, the various types that exist um, that's, that falls under the definition of FGMC. 
What we also understand is that this practice, it can cause immense physical and psychological damage. We also understand that the harmful practice is internationally recognized as a grave violation of women and girls' human rights. Yet this invasive practice, um, which is done primarily to control the sex drive of women and girls, it continues in communities found worldwide. But the overview that I'm about to give you today is based on the evidence that Equality Now and Partners have from um, 12 countries, and this is across the Asia Pacific. So if you ever go into Equality Now's um, website, you will be able to see this interactive map, and I'll try and share it here, um, that basically um, you know, shows you information about FGMC in various countries. So when you zoom in, you will see that, um, you know, it gives you the percentages, it gives you in what communities, um, you know, there is data on the practice of FGMC, et cetera, et cetera. So to summarize for you, there are at least 11 countries that we know of in South and Southeast Asia where there is evidence that FGMC is taking place and it is affecting the health, lives and rights of millions of women and girls in the region. But how bad is the situation? It's really hard to tell. And this is because of the lack of uh, reliable government data on FGMC in Asian countries. And what this also means is that the accurate scale of how many women and girls are impacted and in what ways they are impacted, all of it remains um, in the dark. So Indonesia and Maldives are the only states in Asia that provide um, a national level prevalence data. But there is evidence um, in the form of academic reports, as Priya has mentioned, um, through anecdotal studies, reports from civil society organizations. And sometimes uh, the media have also sporadically sort of like um, shed light on the existence of this practice. And um, based on all of this, what we found out is that countries like Brunei, India, Malaysia, Pakistan, Philippines, Singapore, Sri Lanka, and Thailand all have communities where FGMC is practiced against women and girls. Um, but in when there is a lack of like national prevalence data, what this also essentially means is that the actual figure of women and girls affected by this harmful practice globally, the estimate is actually much higher than the estimate that we have right now. Now, Priya has already given us the global data. So from the global data, um, which has been published by UNICEF, and this is the global data from 2016. It tells us that based on national level prevalence data from around the world on the practice, there are 200 million women and girls globally who are survivors of FGMC. Interestingly, in 2015, the estimated global figure was 125 million. So what happened in the meantime? How did the numbers go up from 125 million to 200 million just in one year? Does that mean that 75 million girls were cut in just one year? Well, actually that wasn't the case. What happened was a large portion of the increase was due to the addition of Indonesia in UNICEF's estimates. So Indonesia went through a 2013 household survey and that household survey revealed that a significant number of women and girls um, had undergone FGMC and that contributed to the global data on FGMC, increasing the total number. So imagine if the addition of one country can push the global data so significantly, imagine what cumulative data from other 10 countries can do. So what this means is that we need to build more and more evidence on the practice in Asia to not only understand the scale and impact of the harmful practice on women and girls, as I um, said, but also to find misconceptions around FGMC. Uh, Priya has already mentioned that FGMC has been widely understood to be a problem or a practice that largely exists in Africa. Um, for those who have some awareness about FGMC being practiced in Asia, they think it is practiced as a religious requirement. Yet the evidence we have so far clearly indicates that the practice exists across cultures, across communities and tradition, and is, it is far from being unique to a particular region or community or beliefs. I have also been asked to talk a bit about government action or the lack of it on FGMC. So across the region in Asia, most Asian governments have so far demonstrated a lack of political will towards addressing the issue of FGMC within their countries. For example, in Singapore, the practice is known to take place in medical clinics, but the government has so far failed to take any concrete action to prevent or address the issue. 
The Malaysian government also in its government report that was submitted to one of the international treaty body on human rights, namely the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and Girls, um, which is also known as CEDAW. Um, so in that report, the Malaysian government has estimated that around 85% of Muslim baby girls had undergone the practice in medical clinics. So government action remained insufficient despite strong recommendations from international human rights treaty bodies and the human rights mechanisms that have constantly urged governments in Asia to take action against FGMC. So, so far, the countries who have received such recommendations includes India, Sri Lanka, Singapore, the Maldives, and others. So, the lack of reliable government data, it we can see that it has broader implication. It leads to lack of funding because the attention is never really... Um, you know, here in Asia, so that that con that significantly impacts, you know, the funding that comes to Asia um, to fight on this issue. It also contributes to the continued lack of awareness, and it gives excuses to our governments to show no political will. In the long run, all of this makes it harder to instigate action, design and implement policies, and also hold governments and other duty bearers to account, particularly in advocating for the introduction and effective implementation of legislative measures against FGMC. Currently, none of the countries in Asia have a law on banning FGMC, which means women and girls in Asia have no legal recourse against this harmful practice. The only development that happened in that respect was in India, um, where in May 2017, a petition was filed before the Supreme Court of India seeking a complete ban on the practice of FGMC and um, seeking the declaration of the practice as illegal and unconstitutional. Subsequently, the matter was referred to a larger constitutional bench where an interim order was passed, but the whole matter still remains pending. So it is therefore high, high time that we work together um, to draw attention to this harmful practice happening in Asia, and the media can play a significant role in all of it. Reporting on the issue is key as gender sensitive media coverage. It has an important role to play in increasing public understanding about human rights violations holding duty bearers to account and instigating positive change. Um, as an example, I would like to draw your attention to Iran. Um, I mean, FGMC continues to be practiced in Western and Southern Iran, but the lack of news coverage has been a challenge for that country. For over a decade, activists were unable to convince Iranian news outlets to report on FGMC, but some journalists have now begun to cover the issue. And last year, our colleague Divya has also teamed up with an Iranian activist to shed light on the issue of FGMC in Iran through, through a blog. And these are some of the examples that I can highlight that shows efforts on ways um, that we're trying to spotlight on the issue. In Asia, there is also a collective called the Asian Network on Ending FGMC, of which Equality Now, Sahio, and uh, Kalinamitra and other partners are part of. The Asian Network is basically um, a collaborative group of civil society actors working across Asia to end all forms of FGMC. So what the network does, it basically acts as an anchor that facilitates the connection, um, the collaboration, and the support um, to be provided to Asian civil society actors and survivors to advocate for an end to all forms of FGMC in the region. So together, we work on various initiatives all year round, especially around day observances. So 13th of February um, is the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation. So a lot of our um, advocacy, activism, campaign, etc. cetera, is sort of like hinged around that date. But we also uh, bring out the issue of FGMC during other day observances. Um, to name a few, we have the 20th of February, which is the World Day of Social Justice. We have the 8th of March as International Women's Day. 1st of June, which is, which is an International Children's Day. 11th of October as the International Day of the Girl Child, and 25th of November as the International Day of Elimination of Violence Against Women, and lastly, the Human Rights Day on the 10th of December. So, yeah, as I said, these are all examples of global day of services, which we think are relevant to bring out the issue of FGMC as well. But there are also other campaigns where we highlight the issue. Um, you, uh, we just um, finished the 16 days of activism on ending gender-based violence. And as you all know, the 16 days, it runs from the 25th of November to the 10th of December. And this is, again, one such example where we highlight the issue of FGMC. There are also other country-specific and region-specific day observances that civil society um, uses as a space to bring attention to this crucial issue. 
Um, the issue of FGMC also intersects with other issues such as health rights, particularly sexual and reproductive health and rights, the rights of the child, the right to bodily autonomy, choice and consent. So partners working on those issues highlight FGMC through the wider work that they do. And FGMC is also, you know, to end FGMC is also a standalone uh, sustainable development goal, um, namely uh, goal 5.3. And as you know, like we're coming towards the end of um, the SDG period. So when we do our advocacy around SDG implementation, we try to use that as a space um, to voice the need to end FGMC in Asia as well. So the media as our allies in this can play a powerful role to amplify the voices of civil society organization, activists and survivors of this harmful practice and inform the mass about how FGMC can have lifelong consequences on women and girls as it affects their physical, psychological and emotional well-being. So um, throughout today's session, we will discuss and brainstorm more on how we can move ahead. But I hope that what I talked about was useful um, in at least setting the context of how things are with regards to FGMC in Asia. Um, I try to talk to you about the lack of data, the lack of government action, and how we're advocating um, on the issue. Uh, we will surely share with you the link to the map that I'm showing here and the link to the blogs and resource and relevant websites that I have touched on today. But if you do have questions, please feel free to uh, put it in the chat and I will uh, try my best to address those. So yeah, that's all I had to share. Um, handing it over back to Shruti. Thanks, Laz. Thank you so much. Um, we have shared a few links in the chat, so uh, we encourage you to keep looking at them. Um, also, we encourage you uh, to keep this interactive. Uh, we welcome all questions, so please feel free to post them on chat. If there is a specific speaker you are directing it to, let us know who that is. And uh, please also ask us about any resource that is name checked or mentioned by any speaker and you would like more information on. Um, thank you, Naz. That was a wonderful um, introduction to uh, an overview of uh, the harmful practice of FGMC in Asia. Uh, we would like to highlight a few things as to why we are bringing them up. One, that FGMC is not a single point issue. FGMC is highly complex, is very connected to cultures and traditions and, of course, religion. Uh, so whenever, as a media person, you um, feel encouraged or confident to cover FGMC uh, for your publication, do not only think about it as a standalone practice, but also look at it as a coming together of many issues. Like Naz pointed out, it is also a women's right issue, a human's right issue. It's an SDG issue. SDGs, uh, like she mentioned, it's I uh, finds mentioned in 5.3 and 2030 is the year we were hoping to uh, achieve the SDGs that we actually set up. And if I'm right, Naz, no country is on track to achieving those. So that is a glaring number. So uh, we're hoping that that is of interest to you as a media person to cover. Uh, it is also a, a grave issue of child rights. So if you cover child rights or child issues, this is also a concern that you can cover. Of course, we will keep giving you more information and hopefully more ideas about how you can pick up coverage about FGMC in Asia. Like I said, there are multi branches here. So please look out for them. And if you have any doubts, any particular questions, please keep letting us know. Let the chat section be active. So let's move on. Uh, so what we had so far was an overview of how things are when it comes to this harmful practice in Asia. Now what we move on to is a little more specific about what happens in certain countries. And we start with Indonesia, uh, a very critical country, as you would have realized from Naz's uh, presentation also. And we are very happy that Rena Hardiani from Kalyanamitra is here to tell us more about the harmful practice in Indonesia. Before Rena begins, she has uh, sent us um, a short video which you would like us all to watch. And after that, she will make her presentation. Uh, Stella, if you could put up the video, I will quickly give an introduction to the video. This is a film about the practice of FGMC in Indonesia. The practice is still carried out 
because people still believe that FGMC is a religious and traditional requirement. FGMC is practiced using FGMC is practiced using various methods in some communities. In this film, you will see an example of FGMC as practiced by one of the tribes in Indonesia, which is the Makassar tribe. FGMC in the Makassar tribe is carried out on girls aged over seven years and celebrated with a traditional party. The film wants to convey the message that FGMC is a dangerous practice and has no benefits and it is not an Islamic tradition. Whatever the form and method, symbolic or non-symbolic, FGMC violates women's human rights. Uh, let's watch the video. Bukan Islam karena kalau tidak disunat, tidak bisa memegang maulid dan tidak bisa memegang hakikat. Kalau tidak disunat karena itu disunat, itu diislamkan. Mulai umur tujuh tahun, sudah mulai di bawah tujuh tahun, itu tidak sah. Kalau disunat di bawah umur tujuh tahun, jadi umur tujuh tahun. Kata ibu saya itu, kalau kita perempuan gak disunat, genit, nafsunya besar, jadi nggak mandang, nggak mandang itu siapa atau saudara tuh nafsu aja gitu. Jadi kan ya pasti kitanya yang namanya perempuan takut gitu. Perempuan itu bukan tradisi Islam. Karena itu tradisi zaman pra-Islam yang panjang sekali sudah dilakukan. Dari, dari agama sendiri saya tidak melihat ada dasar valid. Baik dari Al-Quran maupun hadis. Al-Quran tidak pernah meng Me mengemukakan baik secara eksplisit maupun implisit tentang uh, sunat perempuan gitu kan kalaupun ada ayat Quran anit tabi'ah min lata ibrahima itu untuk laki-laki gitu kan bahkan juga tidak ayat itu tidak tidak bicara tentang sunat sebetulnya tapi tentang akidah Ibrahim yaitu uh, tauhid hari ini aku menyunatkan anakku Zaman dulu kan aku disunat, ya ikutin tetangga-tangga juga sih. Oh gitu, kita masuk dulu ya ke ruang praktek ibu ya. Jadi gini mbak, saya kasih tahu, sekarang kan peraturan pemerintah itu, uh, khusus untuk baby yang baru lahir, khususnya untuk perempuan itu kan uh, tidak dianjurkan dan tidak diwajibkan untuk dilakukan tindakan sunat. Seperti itu, karena bisa mengakibatkan Uh, robek pada uh, daerah selap darahnya seperti itu kita punya standar kompetensi tidak ada kompetensi untuk melakukan sunat perempuan sehingga dalam mengembangkan pendidikan kurikulum yang disusun itu tidak ada untuk sunat perempuan karena memang tidak ada di dalam filosofi profesi kami itu melakukan sunat perempuan itu tidak ada itu yang membuat kami agak sedikit uh, khawatir bidan-bidan ini selama pendidikan tidak pernah diajarkan bagaimana cara melakukan sunat perempuan. Tapi begitu masuk ke masyarakat, terutama yang di perifer, bidan-bidan di daerah-daerah, uh, ya mereka dituntut untuk melakukan itu. Formasi juga kalau mereka tidak mau. Sepertinya kurang diterima oleh masyarakat. 
Nah. nah di Indonesia hitan perempuan itu sudah lama dilakukan dan diperkirakan sejak masuknya Islam ke Indonesia. Nah itu berkembang sebagai satu tradisi. Walaupun kalau kita tanya kepada orang yang melakukan hitan perempuan ditanya apa ini ketentuan dari agama, umumnya ibu katakan ya dasarnya tidak tahu. Dan para pakar juga berbeda pendapat dalam soal itu. Jadi ada yang mengatakan itu wajib, ada yang mengatakan itu sunnah, ada yang mengatakan tidak. Kira dari perspektif anak, salah satu prinsip pelindungan anak itu kan mendengarkan pendapat anak gitu ya. Kalau memang anaknya sudah, kan ada juga praktek sunat perempuan yang sudah agak gede anaknya. Memang kebanyakan pada masa bayi begitu ya. Tentu saya kira orang tua, kalau dalam konteks undang-undang pelindungan anak, orang tua, negara, dan masyarakat wajib melindungi anak begitu ya. Dalam konteks ini kan seharusnya orang tua pun ketika akan melakukan sebuah tindakan harus melihat betul bahwa apa yang dia lakukan, apakah sudah melakukan perlindungan anak atau belum gitu. Ketika dia kemudian dalam hal ini memang anak menjadi pihak yang sangat lemah, apalagi dalam kondisi anak yang kebanyakan masih bayi dilakukan sunat perempuannya begitu ya. Itu menjadi hal yang sulit untuk anak-anak sehingga memang Hal ini menurut saya negara yang wajib melakukan pelarang. Walaupun sedikit, pertanyaannya adalah itu tindakan medik atau bukan? Mesti itu tindakan medik karena melakukan potongan pada bagian tubuh. Kalau dia tindakan medik, apa dasarnya? Kalau seorang dokter atau seorang perawat atau bidan melakukan tindakan medik tanpa ada indikasi medik itu saja sudah bermasalah karena itu melanggar kode etik jadi itu nah kalau ada manfaat di dalam literatur apapun kita cari tidak ada manfaatnya malah lebih banyak mudaratnya ya tentu bagi saya sih sebaiknya tidak dilakukan jangan lakukan hitan terhadap perempuan tidak ada gunanya Begitu. Bahkan kemungkinan juga membawa, membawa bahaya Kalau praktek hitam membawa bahaya maka kita harus tegak Thank you, Stella, for sharing that. And thank you, Rina, for sending us this very, very informative and sensitive video. Um, before I pass the reins on to uh, Rena, I would like to introduce her briefly. Rena Hardiani is a women's rights activist. She is the vice chairperson of Kalyana Mitra, a feminist organization established in Jakarta in 1985. Rena will be speaking on FGMC in Indonesia and how the media can overcome, help overcome advocacy challenges. Rena, over to you. Uh, could you please check if you're able to share your presentation? Yes, I will share my presentation by myself. All right, thank okay. you so much. Uh, thank you, Shruti. So let me share my presentation. Is it okay, Shruti? Yes, maybe you can make it uh, full screen. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So as you see in the video, so how is the practice of FGM in Indonesia? It still happened until now because of uh, family tradition. Even they don't know if uh, the reason is because of uh, religion they don't know which one which uh which first in quran that allow or obligation for uh, fgmc so they just follow the family tradition actually so uh, fgmc has been practiced and preserved for generation to generation in some indonesian communities like in makassar tribe 
as part of cultural and religious and social norms. In our local context, there are some terms of uh, FGMC in local language. And then our government, they don't use FGMC because they don't recognize there are some female genital mutilation because uh, the government said that uh, female circumcision is different with uh, the practice in Africa. So they don't like using term of FGMC. So they better use uh, P2GP or in English cutting and wounding of female genitalia. And in Indonesia, people perceive circumcision as a required act of faith and part of tradition. And then there are some beliefs in our uh, community. One of them uh, already shared by the lady in the video. Uh, they believe that for becoming a good Muslim woman, so they should be circumcised. And also another um, myth or beliefs in our society is to purify girls to help them control sexual appetite and prevent them from growing up as promiscuous women. So this is very gender stereotype myth in our society. And then based on our data, <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, we don't have the recent data on FGMC. So we only have uh, in 2030 from the Ministry of Health. So uh, they, they are 51.2% girls children age zero until 11 years having been circumcised and with the highest age of FGMC at uh, one until five months. And then uh, in eight out of 10 cases, parents had uh, suggested their daughter to perform FGMC on behalf of family tradition, religious obligation and cultural beliefs. And this practice happened in urban or rural and also in even in the city also still happen. So in rural area, the majority of cases of FGMC were performed by midwife. And in urban area, uh, they're usually do, done by traditional birth attendants. And in Indonesia, the most common practice is FGMC type 1 and type 4 and then done by medical personnel and also traditional birth attendant. And uh, this is how the practice of FGMC happened in Indonesia. Some of them cut part of the clitoris and perpuse and scrap the urethral opening. This is the, the medical term. And even there are also symbolic uh, without injury. But like in the video, we believe that even non, uh, symbolic or non-symbolic, it, it is violence against women. And then Nakayana Mitra uh, has study in, 2000, in 2021. So we found that there are still many demedicalization of FGMC. And uh, it's, it has happened in clinic or hospital, health center, and also traditional midwife. They charge uh, the price to the customer to the mother around three until 40 US dollar this is a package medical package for maternity circumcision and also ear piercing and it happened for uh, from the newborn until five years old and uh, the procedure is uh, by a wrapped scratch cut uh, with coins also and then there are also uh, some tools utilized by the by the traditional scrum scissor or the midwife like scissor, cotton, tweezer, needles, and another tools. And the practice of FGM are publicly advertised through web, social media. So this is very open for public, and there is no monitoring and also penalty from our government because our government still uh, legitimate this practice. And also we have a fatwa of Indonesian Ulama Council. So this is the status of legisl legislation on FGMC in Indonesia. Actually in 2006, we have a good uh, regulations. So this regulation prohibit the medicalization of female circumcision uh, for health officer. But unfortunately, two years later into 
2008. So the Indonesian Ulama Council or MOI, so they issued a fatwa against the prohibition on the grounds that female circumcision is part of Sharia. Uh, and then there is also pressure from the Indonesian Ulama Council to our government to change the regulation. So in, uh, based on the fatwa, FGMC is described as makrumah or honorable deed. Uh, it is not a sunnah or habitual practice, uh, but mubah. Mubah is natural or merely permitted. Uh, if the practice is harmful and bringing suffering or mudorot or uh, it's dangerous, it is haram or forbidden in Islam. But uh, in the point is the fatwa said that uh, any prohib any uh, law prohibit FGMC is against Sharia. So our government in 2010 changed the good law with uh, bad law, <laughs> with the bad regulation. So uh, in 2010, uh they they legalized the fgm through a standard operational procedure by skilled health personnel by using the needle so this is the sop or standard operating operating procedure in the legislation in 2010 and then uh, at that time uh, and women movement in indonesia is very angry with this with this regulation because it's a uh, Regress, regression of the regulation because we already before that uh, in 2006 we have good and then in the 2010 so it's uh, very bad yeah, regulation so uh, there is uh, there are a lot of domestic and inter international pressure from NGOs and international agencies and also United Nations like CEDAW committee and then it's success to to push our government to repeal this regulation and then they have new regulations in 2014 but uh, but unfortunately this is not a uh, law uh, to prohibit uh, fgmc but this is to soften the practice or standard operating procedure of uh, fgmc so uh, the the standard operating procedure is by washing the vulva with ovidon iodine this is uh, like uh, yes, this is uh, like medicine, something like that. By using a ghost pad, then cleaning the dirt between the clitoral purpose and clitoral glands. So it means that our government, uh, they, they not they don't uh, brave to make a law to prohibit FGMC because of the fatwa in two thousand eight. And then even they have roadmap and action plan to prevent. Uh, FGMC, but this roadmap and action plan, uh, they don't have mo monitoring mechanism and the target not to revoke the regulation of from the Ministry of Health. So it's more uh, for prevention to increase the awareness and also to 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 push the indicator of the government achievement in the national medium term development plan. So uh, we think uh, we, we need to monitor the implementation of the national action plan. And there is also government regulations concerning implementation of achievement of sustainable development goals uh, in one target in point uh, in 5.3 concerning the elimination of all forms of dangerous practices, including child marriage and also FGMC. And um, Indonesia has a lot of uh, ratification on UN treaty, but unfortunately uh, there is lack of implementation, including CEDO and also CRC, and also related with the FGMC is Convention Against Torture. So there is lack of implementation. And this is recommendation for the government from the CEDO committee in the in the last concluding observations. But until now, there is no progress, especially to criminalize all forms of FGMC. And this is the challenges in advocating FGMC in Indonesia. So we, we still have lack of comprehensive and reliable data from the government on the extent and nature of FGMC and also strong views in society that FGMC is a family tradition, religious obligation, and cultural beliefs. And we don't have regulation that strictly prohibit FGMC. 
public understanding is very lack on sexual and reproductive health and rights, lack of media coverage, and also lack of funding. So not uh, only some women NGOs still consistent to advocate FGMC, and I think very difficult to find funding for FG to eliminate FGMC in Indonesia. And why we need more media coverage? Because not many media in Indonesia who are interested to cover to cover the issue of FGMC. So in Indonesia, uh, the media are uh, is more interested with another pressing issues such, such as election that will happen next year, corruption, economic growth. And they think FGMC is not a sexy issue for media and also for its reader. And uh, the second one is to boost uh, massive public awareness to change the mindset of some myths and misconception of FGMC and also to highlight the effects of FGMC on the mental and physical health, education, economic opportunities, sexual and reproductive rights for effective, effective girls, women, and non-binary individuals. Because uh, not many people know about the effects of FGMC. They only know this is religious obligation, this is family tradition, but they don't know the effect or the negative impact for the, their baby girls. And also to encourage multi-actors and multi-sectors approach for accelerating the elimination of GMC, not only from the health perspective, but also from human rights and uh, also for uh, maybe cultural, cultural uh, views or perspective that also can use to, to engage more multi-actors. And to raise awareness about international human rights laws and frameworks to promote government accountability. Because in Indonesia, they, they have a lot of ratification, but lack of implementation. So we need government accountability, how they implement the law, in, uh, the law uh, uh, on the ratification of some international convention. And this is what media can do uh, through raise awareness by using various media platform to inform to the public that uh, the effect or harmful effect of FGMC, its prevalence, and the importance of stopping this practice. Educational content by creating informative content, explaining the culture and health implication of FGMC in ensuring the audience understands and the reason behind the campaign. So in Indonesia, it's very difficult when we're talking or to explain um, with religious perspective because if they believe uh, if they have strong belief, it's very difficult to change their belief. But uh, by informing the impact, especially uh, we, we explain that uh, there is no benefit on the health of the baby girls. So maybe they 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 can accept our campaign or our our reason why they should stop the FGMC. And then uh, I think it's very important collaboration with NGOs. So media should collaborate with NGOs because we have a lot of data and information. If you need uh, substance or content that need to be written and uh, or for the media coverage, you can also contact us, NGOs. And interviews ex experts. So like in our video, we also interview religious leader, uh, National Commission on the Child Protection, and also women activists or scholars also is very important to interview. And highlight legal measures, report on legal action taken, taken against FGMC practices, emphasizing the importance of legal framework in preventing and penalizing this practice. So we, we need to consi consistently uh, sounding to the government the need of the law the strict law to prohibit FGMC because if we don't have strict law, uh, the practice of FGMC uh, still happen in Indonesia because there are a lot of requests from the people. Um, another media can do is cultural sensitivity. So you can approach the issue with cultural sensitivity, acknowledging the cultural context while advocating for change myths around FGMC. So there are a lot of myths in um, in Indonesia, for instance, so maybe you you can also try to engage 
progressive religious leader who who against FJMC to explain that uh, FJMC is uh, is not a good tradition because it will give a negative impact to the women's and girls. And it's very important to engage community leader, feature stories of community leaders who actively op oppose or against FGMC, encouraging others to follow the example and fostering community-led initiatives. So it's very important also to make a feature stories of community leaders. So if uh, even we don't have even we don't have the strict law to prohibit FGMC, but if there is some uh, some effort uh, or some uh, some action uh, from our community leader or uh, maybe organization, women organization or chat organization, so you can make a feature stories. Yeah. You can highlight how they effort in elimination in eliminating FGMC, and it's very important to utilize social media different social media platform to create campaign, hashtag, and also challenges that engage a wider audience and promote a, a collective effort, so an FGMC. So that's all uh, from my side, so we can continue for discussion. Thank you, Shruti. Thank you so much, Rena. Uh, lots of critical points here. Thank you so much for raising them. Um, like we said, we are making an attempt to highlight the multifaceted um, nature of FGMC in Asia. And as Rina's presentation showed, um, there are so many aspects of this issue that you can write on as a media person. Uh, like she pointed out, there are international obligations that um, a lot of countries or most Asian countries have. Uh, in terms of protection of women and girls and in, uh, in terms of protection of children. Again, these can be held accountable to um, in your pieces. Also, um, as you saw how sensitive and difficult and graphic the understanding of FGMC can be, um, as you saw in the presentation Reina just showed, uh, it is important to highlight what makes FGMC um, such a harmful practice. And the more you read about it, the more you understand it, um, we are hoping that you'll feel more and more encouraged to show what a human rights violation it is. Um, we'll be happy to share Reina's presentation so you have a better understanding and a reference point uh, about FGMC in Indonesia. And also, thank you so much, Reina, for sharing what media can specifically do um, as you have seen in the agenda, we'll have a discussion session at the end. Um, so we were hoping that we will have a more in interactive discussion on how FGMC can be covered in Asia. Because like I mentioned earlier, it's often looked at as too sensitive to touch, uh, that there is not enough information, or that it's a single point issue, which if covered once, then uh, is covered enough. But like all our speakers would say, we need consistent year-long coverage. And you can either do it marking specific important days, as Nas pointed out, which is uh, February 6th, day of zero, in, um, zero Intolerance Day, or Women's Day, or during 16 days of activism from November 25th to December 10th. Or you can start your own campaigns to report on it. Uh, thank you, Rena, again. Uh, from Indonesia, we move to the Maldives. We have the wonderful Zayan with us. Um, let me introduce him briefly. Zayan Ismail is passionate about inclusivity, tolerance, youth, and gender advocacy to make his society safer for everyone to succeed in their brightest potential. Growing up in the Maldives, a country of paradox and upheaval, Zayan sees youth's disillusionment and apathy, yet acknowledges their vibrant potential to bring progress. Zayan volunteers with Utema, a CSO that works for gender advocacy in the Maldives. He's here today to talk about social tradition and conservative messaging, FGMC in the Maldives. Zayan, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Shruti. Um, I hope you all can hear me well. Um, good morning and thank you so much to the panelists as well. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. 
um, hoping that you can see. If you're not able to share, Zayan, Stella would be able to share your presentation. Are you able to see? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Um, and I'll just, um, you know, give a quick introduction to, um, you know, what's happening in the Maldives, um, specifically um, as, you know, we can compare it with other countries. Um, in the Maldives, it's quite different um, when you compare it within the region because FGMC is not, you know, something that we grew up talking about, certainly, and it's something. It's not something that was commonly known before. Um, and I want to just give you an introduction into the. Can we go back to the other slide? Sorry. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, when you when it comes to the Maldives, I just want to give you a bit of an overview and introduction because FGMC, as it pertains, or any social change. It, as it pertains is very much governed in the Maldives by society, by culture and tradition. And the Maldives is, you know, a country made up of 1,190 islands, and each island has unique culture and tradition of their own, which makes it very difficult for researchers and also, um, you know, pra uh, practitioners to see what's actually happening. Um, and that makes um, the research on FGMC quite difficult as well. Uh, we have 26 atolls um, in the country, and our, our population is about 500,000 people, of which half of which are actually young people, um, age 18 to 35. And the culture is very much um, an amalgamation of many things um, from Africa, Persian, Arabic, um, but it's, of course, dominantly um, characterized by the Islamic faith and the southeastern heritage, um, because it, it's Maldives is sort of like what you would see in Indonesia, um, as Rena has mentioned um, about cultures in Indonesia or Malaysia. It's sort of similar in that sense, because the culture of um, Islam was introduced only 800 or 800 years ago. I mean, it's quite recent and Islam was practiced um, and it's still very much practiced in a more cultural sense rather than in an orthodox way that you find in, say, for instance, in the Middle East or elsewhere. Um, it's very much influenced by traditional Maldivian culture. Um, it's not um, a conservative. But if we go on to the next slide, we see that there is sort of um, this change in the society over the past 25 years. Um, the Maldivian culture was very much um, vibrant and it still is, but we see that there is a growing conservative element in the country. And this has led to sort of the regression of women's rights because at the turn of the 21st century, the Maldives you know, introduced a lot of um, gender equality laws and in fact, in the in the region itself, it is one of the most um, um, e equal countries when it comes to the law. But when it comes to implementation, it's still, you know, very lacking. Um, but at the same time, women enjoyed relative freedom in society. Um, and they we have, you know, when it comes to education, healthcare, and every, everything else, women sort of enjoyed that. But it, it started to change in the early 2000s and post-2010. And with a democratic reform, we saw that the Islamic or the traditional Orthodox communities sort of started having their own political will. And they started to have political um, footing within governance, which led to a lot of laws or you know, regression of societal um, customs being reintroduced. 
Um, and if you go into the next slide, um, we see that there is a dismal representation of women in positions of power. And now why do I tell this? It's the fact that, you know, for many years, um, women enjoyed um, a positions of power in, in the country. And this directly influences the laws within the country. Because when, when we represent women, we see that there, we, we can have um, equal laws. And this is very um, distressing because this was a recent change. And the current government is quite conservative. Um, and we, we are finding that we are finding difficulty in engaging um, when it comes to different um, topics, including FDM or other um, topics pertaining to gender equality. Now, looking into FGM um, on the next slide, please. FGM um, in the Maldives was first um, sort of studied in the demographic health survey by the government and by other UN agencies. And we found that there were 13% of women aged 15 to 49 were circumcised. And in the Maldives, um, we call it, um, you know, so a, a female circumcision, and it is a rite of passage for girls into Islam. Um, boys are still circumcised in the Maldives, um, accustomed with a big celebration um, that we saw in what was happening in Indonesia as well. But this practice of um, female circumcision died down in the early 90s, and it wasn't really talked about and, or in the 80s. And it wasn't um, you know, something to be celebrated, but rather a very cultural practice because Islam was, as I said, practiced culturally as, as opposed to in an orthodox way. And the age of circumcision, 83% of um, circus, circumcised women, 15 to 49, were circumcised before the age of five. Because in the Maldives, um, the, the prevalence of circumcision is mostly type four or pricking, as you would call it. Um, and according to their mothers, only 1% of girls, 0 to 14, were circumcised. Girls are more likely to be circumcised if their mothers were circumcised. And from research, we found that this was a more cultural practice and done by the, um, the practice, the women um, in the society, because it was more of um, a very matriarchal system back in the day, as opposed to now what we see, which is quite patriarchal. And the opinions of the practice were that, you know, 10%, only 10% believe that the practice is required by religion, and 8% believe that the practice should be continued. So you can see that it's very low, because most of the people believe that it's more so a cultural practice as opposed to religious. Um, and this sort of continued um, in the sense that, you know, over the years it died down and nobody really um, believed in the practice um, and it never happened. Um, and certainly um, in the past few years, um, there were certain laws or restrictions and it was never something that was medicalized as well in the Maldives, um, which what you see in other regions, in other countries where you would have clinics. Um, we never have it. Um, it's mostly, um, you know, boys, as I said, that are circumcised in by religion, um, in Islam, in the Maldives, but never girls. But this sort of changed um, quite recently. And that's what I'm trying to get to on the next slide. As I was mentioning, this was, you know, um, something, a cultural practice of the past. The prevalence of female circumcision increases steeply with age which goes to show that, you know, women, um, this was something of the past, um, women aged 45 to 49, that's 38%, um, which, which goes to show that it's something that happened in the past and only 1% of girls in this day and age, in the early 2000s, um, were circumcised from 15 to 19 um, years of age that, that were interviewed. So this sort of, um, you know, is evidence to that this was happening and it sort of died down 
But if we go into the next slide, we see that it sort of resurfaced once again. Um, in 2021, a religious scholar um, at the Maldives National University um, openly propagated the practice of FGM um, being uh, enforced or favored in Islam. And he was fired for um, you know, talking about this, um, but he was reinstated later. <laughs> um, it sort of happens in the Maldives quite a bit of quite often that you know these um men get away with you know saying whatever they want, they get fired, but they get reinstated later. Um and this was of course shocking um because the fact that this was a professor. Um, he is a professor and he also holds a doctorate, um, a PhD um, with it, with Islam, within Islamic knowledge. And the fact that he was the one who propagated the open use of FGM as, you know, a, a rite of passage. And that's something that is to be practiced in Islam. And this led to mass upheaval on social media, within governance, within UN agencies. And the fact that this was recent sort of led to the open conversation on FGM and led to a lot of people coming out with their stories from the past, but also of recent happenings as well, which is evidence to the growing radicalization and the growing conservative elements in the country. And we do have a fatwa majlis, um, like most um, Muslim countries in the region, um, but the national, um, we sort of like the national religious advisory body in the country. But the fatwa majlis, um, as opposed to in other countries, does not have any legal backing because they can release fatwas. But since we practice the British common law um, with with Sharia as well, but it you know it's sort of um, the uh, the fatwa is released mostly for Islamic rulings as opposed to the common law within society. So they, the fatwa majlis becomes quite active when it comes to you know restricting women's rights in the country. We see many times, especially pertaining to abortion in the past. Um, abortion is legalized in the Maldives, but under very strict conditions. But we saw that when it came to FGM, they failed to release any statements and they were very silent. Um, and they didn't really you know, engage well at all um, on this issue. And this led to, of course, um, a lot of you know, criticism from within the government. But you know, since we also had held meetings, the uh, joint CSOs, uh, coalition within the country, the government issued that, you know, the Fatwa Majlis releasing um, and um, the practice of F um, ban or banning FGM is sort of giving relevance to it or acknowledging it, which they mentioned that, you know, it's never something that's common in the Maldives as opposed to in other regions. So why release a Fatwa in the first place? But we advocated um, for this and if you look at the article that's on the presentation on the Times of Ardu, um, Ardu is the southernmost um, island in at all in the country, and it's um, where FGM is also on the rise as well. Um, we find that um, when it comes to GBV, DV, and also FGM and other harmful practices, it's mostly practiced in the southern region as opposed to the north in the Maldives. So this is also part of the culture as well. Um, and it's very interesting from our own interviews, um, including with the minister who was from the South, back, um, the former minister of gender, who was from the South mentioned that, you know, in the South, this was um, a very cultural practice and something that they believe that it was, you know, um, a rite of passage or coming of age sort of thing for women and girls. Um, but of course, we know that it is harmful um, and it should not be practiced at all. So if you go into the next slide, we see that there were some positive developments. Um, the, mini the then Ministry of Gender, Family and Social Services, now they've cut out um, gender overall, and now they just call it the Social and Family Development Ministry. 
Um, they replied to the recommendations made by the CEDAW committee. And Hayes stated that the government will bring in necessary legislative changes to address the issue, um, which goes to show that, you know, there was um, a right of reply or they did in fact acknowledge that this was happening and they will take necessary measures. But keep in mind that, you know, this was um, a pledge by the former government. This is not a pledge that we see in the current government. But regardless, um, the CEDAW hearings will continue and the CEDAW committee is ready to take action on these issues um, in the Maldives and other UN agencies also are closely monitoring this issue. Um, and we continue to shed a light on this because I think in a, in a positive way, when the scholar talked about this in 2021, in you know this day and age, it sort of gave rise to the conversations around FGM in the Maldives, because it's even though it's not something that's highly prevalent, the fact that people are propagating this means that there are conservative elements in the country that perhaps might be practicing this in secrecy. And we know that there are um, child marriage incidents as well in the country um, out of court, um, you know, children bearing children in the country as well out of wedlock and so on and so forth. You know, there are uh, conservative elements coming up and we have advocated um, with the government as well as other UN agencies um, to include FGM as well as other um, uh, such instances, GBV, et cetera, in the next um, demographic health survey, which is supposed to take place next year or very soon, so that we can get a perfect picture of it in the country. But um, the positive um, development is that, you know, the government is committed and we hope that this continues. And I'm sure um, Shruti and um, as well as Julie would know, this is not easy to engage with the government in the Maldives, but we continue to raise our voice and we continue to um, uh, push forward for this issue. And I hope that, you know, this was a very interesting case study, because if you think of Maldives, we think that, you know, it's sort of this um, uh, island nation or paradise uh, tourist destination. And it's true. Uh, you really have to proceed to believe it. But at the same time, there are social stresses that um, impact the country and very much, um, even though it's low in prevalence um, and something of the past, it's being reinstated. And I think that's the worry for us um, working within the CSOs and certainly equality now as well. The fact that this is being you know, reintroduced goes to show that we have much work to be done. But I hope that this was insightful and um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, oh, Zan. Yes. Yeah, yeah, go on, go on. Yes. Oh, by the way, those pictures are pictures that I took um, <laughs> of um, <laughs> some of the uh, scenery. So, but I, I just want to, you know, preface this but by saying it's a beautiful country. Do visit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Zayan, so much. Of course, it was very, very insightful. Um, I think uh, Maldives is a very good example of um, a region, and of course, not exclusive in this facet, that FGMC is um, definitely a religious dictate, though not required by religion, has no benefits, but um, has messaging which uh, purportedly talks about benefits or control of sexual drive or whatever else may be uh, the reason given for it. But Maldives is very interesting in the sense of um, understanding that FGMC continues as a, as a cultural practice, as a traditional practice. So uh, the push may not necessarily be that it's found in some religious text, though that is a huge, huge push, but it's passed down culturally and becomes a norm. And um, as Anne pointed out, though there had been a few positive moves um, in protecting women and girls from FGMC in the country, the political shifts and the reliance on more conservative um, ideation and more conservative uh, groups, collectives and bodies uh, is changing that 
and probably will lead to a few regression, regressions in the positive uh, movements that we have seen in ending FGMC. So as media persons, that is also, we are hoping, an interesting aspect that you could analyze. One, definitely that it's a traditional practice, that it's a cultural hand down. Uh, so my grandmom did it, so my mom did it, so I do it. That is very generational. And also that government shifts, um, conservative forces, talk, um, scholars, uh, university professors, all of them can be very, very influential here. So again, uh, thank you, Zayan. If you have any specific questions, please do ask. They're all around. And uh, we are hoping that all of the points that are raised uh, will come back up and help you in the last discussion. Of course, the chats are open. If you have any questions, doubts, concerns, please put it out there. This is a workshop. Uh, and if you want to direct it to any particular uh, speaker, please let us know. So from the Maldives, we are moving on to Canada. Um, of course, not in Asia, but we have Blessing with us who has very kindly stayed up today late and um, is here to share her experiences uh, of dealing with uh, the media in Canada. I will give a brief introduction and I will hand it over to Blessing. Blessing Timidi Digha is a black woman, feminist, advocate, storyteller, and community-based researcher. She brings all her intersections and ideologies to the work she does on gender-based violence and sexual reproductive health and rights. She likes to kickstart very uncomfortable conversations on issues that concern, affect, and impact girls and women. Blessing works part-time as an advocacy campaign coordinator at the NFGM Canada Network. And as she likes to loudly proclaim, no form of violence against women exists in a vacuum. Female genital mutilation is linked to other forms of violence perpetrated against girls and women. Thank you, Blessing. Welcome. Um, and we look forward to your experiences from Canada. And also, please share a few takeaways from the media workshop with Canadian media persons uh, that I had the pleasure of co-moderating with you this early this year um, and what impact it has had, if at all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning from Canada and um, well done to everybody um doing this work it's important work it's hard work but um we do it all the same um earlier this year i think in may may precisely um the end fgm canada network and equality now worked together to create um a fact sheet an fgmc fact sheet in canada and we use that fact sheet to reach out to journalists so I work in the network as the advocacy campaigns coordinator. And what that means is for many times, I'm the first person that, um, you know, people speak with. And times when I'm not the first person, it definitely comes back to me. And then I build the rapport. So building up to that, um, to that webinar, we didn't call it a webinar. We called it a workshop because we wanted people to attend and see it as something that was going to be very interactive. I sent out at least 4,000 emails. I kid you not. I was sending out emails to the point that some people asked me to not send them emails again. Some, some emails started bouncing because I guess they flagged me. And so when I sent the emails, it would come back to me. Um, the network providers, the email providers were telling me that they couldn't deliver um, the emails anymore. I reached out to different organizations, the Canadian Association of Journalists, um, the Canadian Association of Journalists on Human Rights. You know, the different organizations reached out to journalists individually and also as a collective. And we had people register. You know, when you send out 4,000 plus emails, you'd expect that at least 1,000 people would register, right? But we didn't get that many people to register. But um, one of the tactics that we used also is that 
we just didn't consider mainstream media. So what that mainstream media rather. So what that means is, you know, many times when we think of media, we only think of radio, we think of TV, and we think of newspapers. So what we did was we also wrote to podcasters, we wrote to bloggers, we wrote to TikTokers, you know, those that had high following and they didn't really have a niche, but they had high following. We reached out to them. We we actually had a podcaster attend. We had two podcasters attend. We had a TikToker also attend the the webinar. Um, the many most of the most of the success we have seen right now is from the new media people, the podcasters and the TikTokers, and also people who are willing to write. We also reached out to people in the university, especially the lecturers and the students who are learning media. So whatever form of media that they were learning, we reached out to universities in Canada. There was a very long list of universities in Canada and I kept sending out the emails. Unfortunately, we had just two uh, um, lecturers attend, but one of our speakers that day was a lecturer and he he designed the first course that talks about trauma-informed journalism. And we were hoping that, you know, going forward, a lot of the university lecturers and um, students will also attend. We're planning something for just them. Hopefully they, they'll be more comfortable to attend, you know, something that is just focused on academia because we also need them to write about it and all that. But one thing that we noticed working or speaking with journalists in Canada is that they, they approach FGMC as either a religious or a cultural thing. And so many of them are like, I don't want to write about someone's culture. I don't want to write about, you know, someone's religion. And even though we have offered many times, okay, write it, let us write it together. We can do a co um, an op-ed together or you write it and we read it, you know, to fill in things that are missing or give you the right lingua. They, they still are very weary, you know, to, to, to do that. A few times we've had a few journalists tell us that I actually wrote about it, but my editor didn't um, didn't approve it, and so we had to target the editors, you know, to come to also attend the um, the workshop. Um, we had five speakers. We had Tara from Equality Now. We had the lecturer Matthew. We had um, one of the few journalist in Canada that writes about um, FGM. She's actually the person who has broken most of the news about FGMC, especially in Canada. There was a suspected case in May. She broke that news. So she also spoke that day. She tried to encourage the uh, journalists who were present on how to get those stories written and how to, you know, put the stories out there without you know causing more harm to the survivors and to the society as a whole. We had one of our board members who is also a filmmaker. Um, she had made a documentary with um, some girls in Kenya and Tanzania on FGMC. So she also spoke you know to the journalists. She's also a Canadian journalist and um, she just spoke to them from a perspective of a journalist, a filmmaker, a documentary maker, and a white woman. We had a black woman who is in academia, who is a student right now, a master's of art student, social justice, but she also runs a not-for-profit organization in the Gambia. She also spoke, you know, to the journalists. And um, we worked hand in hand with the FGMC. Canada fact sheets that we, you know, we worked on together with Equality Now. And we had, you know, we had journalists ask us a lot of questions, right? And the question that we kept seeing was, how do we get 
you know, how do we get stories? And we we had to let them know that you can reach out to us, you can reach out to organizations, you know, to get stories. And you can also back up the stories with statistics. It doesn't have to be totally Canadian statistics, right? You can show that it's prevalent um, in the world, it's prevalent around the world. So um, a lot of you might not know, but a lot of the people who come to Canada through the asylum route, one of the top reasons, one of the top three reasons that they give for leaving their countries is female genital mutilation and cotton. So I'm originally from Nigeria and Nigeria is one of the countries with the highest prevalence of female genital mutilation. In Nigeria, we practice the four types and it depends on you know which ethnic group you come from. The type one is still the mainstream, is the one that you know occurs mostly, but the four types of female genital mutilation slash cutting happens in Nigeria. And so we all, you know, used our different the different knowledge that we have, both lived experience and professional experience to talk to journalists. What were the challenges? The challenges was, you know, journalists not responding. And I had a very big issue with that because when journalists need us, they 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 will bother you with emails. You're waking up 6 a.m., someone has sent you an email. 7 a.m., there's an email waiting for you. But when you need them, when, you know, we, we were just asking for one hour, 30 minutes of their time and they... They didn't respond. They didn't respond. And Shruti can bear witness. It's not like we sent out um, like a blast email. So initially it was just when we were doing the save the date, we sent out the same emails to everyone. But when we started sending out those emails, we sent them curated emails, like individual emails that speak to each person that speak to what everybody talks about. So if you're working on health, we tailor that email to you. If you're a journalist that works on human rights, we tailor the, you know, we tailor that email to you. Please imagine on my behalf, on Shruti's behalf, having to sit down and write as many as those emails, tailored emails to each person, and we were not getting responses. The ones who were responding were either please take me off your mailing list. How did you get my email? And you know, all that. And it was just so, it was disheartening. I recently told one of the journalists who reached out to me because she just kept sending me emails and I had to ask her, did you see my email in May? She's like, yes, I saw it. She never responded, but now she needs my organization to give her data and she's right on my case please respond, please respond, give me your number, you know? And I'm like, that's not how this thing works. It's a relationship, right? We do the work, we have the knowledge, we have the statistical knowledge, we have the field knowledge. We just want you to use your platforms on our behalf. We understand that it is challenging. It can be challenging. We understand that there can be bureaucracy but we also want to see the effort, you know, we want to see the effort from your end in working with us. Don't just say, oh, I, I'm going to meet, um, I'm going to meet backlash, so I'm not even going to try. So that was very challenging. That was very challenging for us, to be honest. And um, for someone who's who has worked in Africa, I've worked in, I worked in Africa for 10 plus years before moving to Canada there's a very huge disconnect The you know journalists in africa will tell you you know what just go write it give it to us many times they might not even read it if you give them that story with a typo they are going to print it that way but coming here it's a different ball game it's a different ball game they don't even want to talk to you they don't attend your, your um events you know and that's disheartening for us so if you're a journalist here, please help us because we need more, more people, you know, to read about this. I didn't know that FGM was happening in the Maldives and I've worked on FGM as, you know, one of the issues under sexual reproductive health and rights 
for more than 10 years. But this is my first time hearing that it happens in Maldives. So imagine how many people don't know many things. The average Canadian doesn't know what female genital mutilation is, to be honest. When they hear it, they are in shock. And the first question they ask you is, why is nobody talking about this? And we tell them, well, the journalists don't want to talk about it. The success stories, like I said, the new media guys have been very helpful. The podcasters, we had a podcaster talk about FGM, talk about the financial implications of FGM, especially when women go back for reconstructive surgery because you know it's not covered by health insurance. So they have to pay out of pocket and it's very expensive. And that was just, you know, that was heartwarming. We've had TikTokers, you know, talk about FGM. We had um, a webinar for teachers in September. And one of the teacher, one of the teachers that joined said she heard it from, you know, that TikToker's page. And, you know, it just, it just helped. It's, it's, um, it really warmed our hearts that, you know, while we have, the mainstream media that have these very huge platforms that, you know, we're pulling back and forth. The new media guys are just ready to jump in. We just have to provide them with, you know, the right words, the right um, statistics and all that, you know. And to be honest, we don't mind doing it. I don't mind doing it. People ask, Sometimes people ask me, can I get statistics for X, Y, Z? I want to put it on my program. I want to mention it in my TikTok and I send it to them. So that has been, you know, very helpful to us, but we still need more people writing about it. We have students in the universities who are part of the, I don't know what they call it, but they have students' newspapers, they have student bulletins. They want to write about FGMC, but even at that level, students, the student editor is like, no, don't write write about it. We need more people to write about FGM. We need more TV stations, you know, to talk about FGM. Um, I always tell the journalists who say, okay, I don't know how to go about it. If you feel you cannot just write about it out of the blues, target important days. So for example, we just finished the 16 days of um, elimination of violence against women that started from November 25th to December 10th. That was, you know, a very good time. You know, you can key into that and write about female genital mutilation. December 10 is Human Rights Day. You can key into that. You can just look at the, um, you know, the, as we, as you call it, auspicious days and write about it. And to be honest, if you don't know, you can also ask us what days, you know, what days can we write about this? What days can we tie this to? And then we can give you those days, those pointers, and um, you work with it. Um, yeah. No offense intended. In rounding up, I would say that journalists are, I've been doing this work for a long time, but the journalists in Canada, they were the hardest demography to reach out to. I thought teachers were going to be worse, but apparently it was the journalists and um, we're hoping that, you know, going forward, we'll be able to get some um, breakthrough. But um, thank you to everyone who is helping us right now and, you know, who will help us as a result of this workshop. I'll stop here. <laughs> Thanks, Blessing. Um, in true Blessing style, um, just expressed our frustrations, gave a hint into the what goes into uh, preparing for a workshop like this. There are hundreds and like in Blessing's case, thousands of emails that go out. Uh, we hope and pray for a lot of attendance and we get a bit of it. Uh, but we will continue as we, as they say, so she persisted. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, thank you, Blessing, for uh, being open about the experiences and sharing uh, what the Canadian media landscape is. You also thankfully answered um, what Winnie um, from Kenya has asked. Hey, Winnie, 
Um, so the question was with the new media, TikTokers and podcasters, etc. Have they had any follow-up conversations on their platforms after the event? This is very insightful. Thank you to all the speakers. So yes, uh, as we see, quote unquote, traditional media sometimes is difficult to break through. We understand the challenges, of course, but uh, new media has been taking up the challenge quite um, boldly, and we hope that. In Asia also, that is a trend we notice. And we hope there are folks here who do um, their own podcasts and social media awareness building. Thank you so much. Blessing again. Um, I would like to now um, re-invite Priya, uh, who will share um, her experiences with the Indian media and uh, how Sayo has relied on a wonderful tradition of storytelling to tell the story of FGMC in the region. There are also a few questions that we've been receiving. I'll post that on chat. I also request the speakers to please have a look. And if there is any answer you would like to post or speak up, just let me know. Over to you, Priya. Thank you, Shruti. Before I begin, I want to give a big thank you note to Naz, Reena, Zen, Blessing. Um, I just want to say that I have worked on this subject for 11 years and I still continue to learn from each one of you. Your anecdotes blow my mind. Nas, thank you about pointing about how 75 million uh, in data was added literally in a span of year. Rina, your presentation was deeply insightful and Zen also to emphasize that it is not an Islamic issue. Religion is only one of the many aspects to consider when we talk about FGMC. Blessing, thank you so much for bringing out the role of new media and TikTokers. I mean, that's where the future of our communication lies. And thank you for your persistence. 4,000 emails, you got to tell us how you do that. <laughs> you got to have a thick skin. Okay, um, I'm going to jump into this. Uh, and while I jump into this, I have to say, this might seem like a factual narrative, but to me, it is deeply personal. And that is why I'm presenting here. And uh, with us uh, here today is also Arifa Jori, my colleague, my friend for 11 years, uh, also co-founder of Sayo. She will also be talking a little bit about the practice of FGMC later on. Um, so to start with, why is this personal for me? Uh, 11 years ago, I started making a documentary called A Pinch of Skin. I was still a student. I was uh, one of those enthusiastic college students who wanted to know it all and also wanted to uncover the practice of FGMC that it happens in India. Before that, there was absolutely no data, let alone any form of visual media. It was unthinkable, right? So when I started making this documentary, uh, a lot happened. One of the major things that happened was I won a president's award. And what that did was it focused the media on my film. So from a, just a college student overnight, I became this NID student uncovers barbaric practice in India. You could almost read the headline screaming. So today I'm here speaking about the role of media in reporting on FGMC. And by media, I don't just mean traditional media. I mean students. I mean new media makers. I mean TikTokers. I mean documentary filmmakers. It's because I am in this movement 11 years on because of media. As a 23-year-old um, reading those headlines, it had a deeply psychological and personal impact on my mind. Um, I'm going to talk about some difficult themes here. And if anyone um, has anything to talk about it, please feel free to unmute, raise your hand, have a discussion on this. But I'm going to also call a spade a spade. Many of the Islamophobic. And as a Hindu girl, where my surname screams out my religion, Priya Goswami, I mean, how much more Hindu can it get? Um, everybody thought that they had a free run with me to bash the uh, community. Um, so I was very excited presenting my film in Pakistan um, because Pakistan is an Islamic state. So I thought nobody would at least bash Islam. Um, and I proved to be so wrong that I can't even begin to explain that experience where people took me out in the corner in a theater and started talking to me, in me to aisa hi hota hai, which, which translates into this is what happens in the community of these people. Um, so 
for me, talking to media, talking the role about the role of media is a deeply personal issue. And also, I hope that through this presentation, in the next 15 minutes, we will be uncovering and unpacking some of the conceptual uh, elements, which get slightly technical. Here, I would like to give a shout out to Shruti. Shruti, thank you so much, because you have held the thread uh, in each presentation talking about how complex um, the issue of FGMC and like you have been saying over and over again, it is not a single point issue. It's not a monolith. There are several entry points into the subject of FGMC that as uh, practitioners, as people who work on the subject, we continue to discover every single day. So without any further ado, I'm going to share my screen and I'll take you through uh, Sayo's uh, Sayo Media Resource, which was a direct response to the Indian media on how Indian and international media on how we were seeing um, some of the reportages on FGMC unfold. All right. So, um, We've already learned in the beginning of this uh, workshop that FGC, female genital cutting, is defined as partial or total removal of external female genitalia or any other injury to the female genital organs for non-medical reasons. Now, I would like to re-emphasize here how important the term non-medical is. Uh, FGC is a tradition. It uh, is perpetuated by the belief that it is the right of passage for women. The reasons given thereof are manifold. We are going to unpack those reasons, but all the reasons are non-medical. Um, trigger warning, if anyone feels like this is too graphic, please feel free to step back. Um, and if you're not comfortable, uh, please let us know. Um, there is no way to talk about FGC without actually going in. And this is what the female genitalia looks like. Clitoris, uthida opening, vagina, labia minora, labia majora, and of course the posterior. Um, while seeing this diagram, uh, we understand that there are many types of female genital cutting uh, slash mutilation that is prevalent uh, and the severity of the cut is the moot point here. Um, WHO classifies FGC slash M, female genital cutting or mutilation, into these three types of uh, cutting. One is just the removal of prepuce, or prepuce is the skin that covers the clitoral hood, uh, or the clitoris, uh, which is the uh, type 2, and type 3 is removal of part of the labia minora, labia majora, sewn together, covering the urethia, vagina, vagina, sorry, leaving a small hole for urine and menstrual fluid. Now, this is, of course, the more extreme form of FGM, female genital mutilation prevalent, and uh, this is not known to be practiced in Asia. So when it comes to depiction of FGC slash M in Asia, I'm going to keep my focus to type 1 and type 2, just so that we have the clarity that this is uh, the more extreme form of removal of the lab, uh, labia minora or labia majora sewing and stitching does not happen or is not known to happen in any form of Asia to the best of all our knowledge. Okay. Um, now, the practice that is most common in India is, uh, well, type 1, which is total or uh, complete or uh, partial removal of the clitoral hood or a partial or total removal of the clitoris itself. Um, this is some global statistics. Okay, uh, the Daudi Boras are known to practice FGMC in India and uh, as are a small uh, section of people in Kerala, we'll get into that later. Um, Daudi Boras are an affluent minority with a dense population in the Western Belt of India and a large diaspora population worldwide. Now, this is extremely important. Uh, as you can see, Daudi Boras are an affluent minority to understand the social and economic positioning of uh, the community that practices FGMC is a oft overlooked nuance. And I want to emphasize that it is not just you know, it's not enough to report FGMC in words such as tribal and bar barbaric. It is also important to understand which is the community that practices it. What do they look like? What is their social and economic standing in the country uh, or just uh, in as a whole? I'll talk more about this later. Um, okay. In India, it is very commonly known as khatna. The other words that are used to refer... Uh, 
to type 1 female genital cutting is khatna khav sunnat all of these terms are interchangeably used in different parts of asia um I have to read this because 10th of December was only like two days, uh, three days ago. Everyone is entitled to the rights and freedoms set forth in this uh, universal human rights declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, and sex. We definitely, we, the activists, practitioners who talk about, uh, media practitioners who talk about ending FGMC, we want to couch this whole issue under the umbrella of that it is a human rights violation. It is a form of gender-based violence. And uh, here are some quick facts about why is it carried out, right? And what are some of the attributes? Why we'll come to later, but what are the, some of the attributes? Some of the attributes include, uh, it is a coming of age ceremony. In India, it happens more often than not at the age of seven. Um, and sometimes in some cases up to 12 years old, um, we have, Sayo has studied what can be the physical complication of type 1 of FGC and a very common attribute which I'm sure is prevalent in all types of FGCs prevalent everywhere in the world that it is a clandestine activity that it is a deeply hushed tradition that you know sometimes the fathers or the men in the family wouldn't know that the mothers or the grandmothers or the buas or the extended family members have taken a child uh, for genital cutting okay um so here I'd like to make a very important uh, nuance and this is research back. Sayo uh, conducted a research in 2016. I'll be happy to share that um, uh, resource, uh, research study. Type 2 and type 3 are severe forms of female genital mutilation. Type 1 can have definitely have physical complications and mental complications, but they are not as severe as type 2 and type 3. And we are talking on a relative scale here. So more often than not, when you interchange facts in the media, like um, female genital mutilation can cause pain in childbirth, we need to understand that that is probably happening for someone who has undergone type 3 of female genital cutting or mutilation. Okay, this is where it gets super interesting. Uh, we did a study, Sayo India did a study, and we found out the following things. Uh, it's 56%, and this is a study in 2016. And uh, sorry, I stand corrected, not Sayo India, Sayo as a whole, Sayo US and India did a study. 56% um, believe that it is done for religious purposes. 45% believe it is to decrease sexual arousal. 42% uh, believe it is to maintain tradition and customs, 27% for physical hygiene and cleanliness, 9% believe, 9 believe that it is to gain respect from the community, 9% believe it is a necessary requirement uh, for a good marriage, and 2% believe it is to increase sexual arousal. Now, here is where uh, I'm going to stop for a while, and I'm going to again draw an attention uh, to the fact that this is a movement where personal is deeply political. So here's the thing, right? Um, I've been as a media practitioner studying this movement for the last 11 years. And when I started off, a lot of people firsthand uh, in person told me that this decreases sexual arousal. And then something happened. Then uh, Sayo got formed, Arifa, Insia, Maria, Shahida, we all got together, women from the community and started advocating that, no, this is not right. This is a form of gender-based violence. And Sayo got in the news as well. The moment Sayo got in the news, the community turned the tables and started saying that, no, this is actually done to increase sexual arousal. And we all, all of us working on ground in a span of like a few months started to see the narrative within the community change from it is done for the reasons of decreasing sexual arousal to it is done for the reasons of increasing sexual arousal. And suddenly there was a comparison given um, to the male circumcision, which is another difficult problematic area to discuss. We shall go into it. And if you have any comments, feel free to drop uh, it in the comment section as well. Um, but what does this tell us? This tells us that while we talk about these movements and facts and figures and data given by, uh, you know, internationally recognized bodies, this movement is a live, thriving entity. People from the community are watching us. They are responding to the movement. They are also changing the narrative around FGMC as the gain, as the movement gains momentum. Now, at this point, I would, um, before going into, because I think Shruti keeps emphasizing this is a workshop. We have some attendees. Please, before I get into the more media nuance, aspect of it can you all do an exercise with me where you can throw the first word that comes to your mind when you think about type one female genital cutting it could be any word just can we have some throw of words in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and 
um, just say the word out loud. Any word that comes to your mind when you think of type 1 female genital cupping? WTH. Thank you, Blessing. I like you a lot. Uh, okay. More words, please. Any words would do. Cut, Nick. You hear it a lot. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Priya, I see a few words in the question and answer section. Sure. So, sure. Uh, Situ says inhuman. Okay. Fiza says invasive. Swati says, my goodness. Okay, thank you. Those are great words. And uh, thank you for responding in such a short notice. Um, inhuman, invasive, my goodness, what the hell, just a nick, just a cut. All of these words are a basic human response to learning the genitalia of a woman. A child is actually non-consensually getting cut, right? But what happens when words like inhuman, barbaric, tribal make it to the national headlines, uh, say in a newspaper which is going to be slipped right under the door of everyone's homes. I don't know how it happens in Maldives or Indonesia or Malaysia. India still has that old-fashioned system of, you know, waiting for the newspaper under your door when the you know newspaper guy slips it. Imagine waking up to read about your own community as a barbaric community as for the national headlines and feeling like what just happened here i am not a part of this i don't associate with these keywords and uh, this is basically um, some form of uh, let's just say misinformation so now i'm going to take a quick dive back in and we are going to talk about the media aspect um, of the presentation right sorry just give me a second Reporting with accuracy. This is where everything comes to play here. Um, first and foremost, we have to understand that this actually, I'm going to stop uh, sh showcasing this. I'm going to showcase something else. This is not from Sayo. This is from my app, Mumkin. And I this uh, two-minute video uh, actually explains what uh, the tradition of female genital cutting actually is. Shruti, can I share a video? Yes, sure. Okay, there you go. Hi, I'm Mumkin. I make difficult conversations possible. Today, let's talk about female genital cutting. So when I say female genital cutting, what comes to your mind? Maybe you think, oh, that's a lot. Maybe you know someone who has undergone this practice. Maybe you have undergone it yourself. Or maybe you'd like to talk about this ritual with someone but just don't know how to start. So let's start right here. Female genital cutting is more common than you think. The UN estimates that over 200 million women and girls have undergone this practice worldwide. And that's just the official data. Many Asian communities practice it as well. One of them is India. All of the record. Yes, female genital cutting is practiced by a few communities in India. It is not just an African ritual, nor is it an Islamic one. In fact, in cultures that do practice it, it's an age-old ritual, a tradition passed down from generation to generation. And because it's a tradition, it is seldom questioned. You see, tradition is key here. And you know what happens when you try to question a tradition? Traditions are a part of who we are. And most of us don't like our long-held beliefs to be challenged. So of course, it's extremely difficult to have these conversations about changing a social norm with someone who actually believes in it. That's where I come in. Mumkin. I make difficult conversations possible. I can help you start a discussion about female genital cutting with your loved ones. It will probably be an emotional journey, but I will be there with you. So start your conversation right here with me. 
one of the reasons why I wanted to show this video is because now we are entering. A, I think my YouTube is still playing. Uh, no, we can't hear anything actually. Oh, uh, we hear. I you. can. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt. Could you please wrap up in two, if that's possible? Uh, I have. I've not even got into the presentation. Um, give me ten. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. So um, I think one of the more important aspects about understanding FGMC is that it is a social tradition. And from the entry point of it being a tradition, now we can get into reporting on FGMC from the parameters of how to report about a social norm uh, respectfully. So I'm going to go back into sharing my screen um, to the Sayo Media Resource Guide. And since we have little uh, time, um, I think, again, like I said, why is it important to uh, important for the media to end, uh, to have a discourse on gender-based violence? First of all, uh, it is very, very important uh, to draw, uh, you know, media's attention to the subject because it ad facilitates advocacy and fundraising for actual advocates uh, of the, you know, anti-FGC movement to start the movement on ground. Second of all, it draws attention to the positive stories and while highlighting that it is a form of human, human rights violation, that it is a form of uh, gender-based violence, it can also draw attention to the people who are resisting the practice from within the community. Thirdly, it counters myth and outdated attitudes. Um, as a storyteller, I can tell you, it blows my mind every time I hear about uh, female gentle cutting, cutting being spoken out there, because every time it is a fantastic story in the background. Someone says, if you don't cut the clitoris, the woman would become a prostitute. Someone says, if you don't cut the clitoris, there is uh, the clitoris is supposed to be like an ant, and that ant is haram or impure. And these stories are such, um, let's just say they are so deeply ingrained in the psyche of women uh, that it's really, really hard to challenge these narratives. And more often than not, this is a practice propagated by women on women. I think someone else's presentation also spoke about how women uh, tend to perpetuate this practice more. Um, and how can media be harmful then? So... There's a lot of things out there that media can do. Media can help us uh, kickstart this movement, uh, shine light on the activists, shine light on what has actually been done, shine light on law and, you know, actually push the wheels of uh, some, uh, in some cases, legis uh, legislation against the practice in the country. But the media can also be deeply harmful. Um, and to understand that, we have, a, um, I'm just going to move forward. Right. Uh, how can media be harmful? First and foremost, media can trigger powerful emotions. This is a headline from uh, Hindustan. Uh, I think this is from Quint. Uh, and I remember when this came out, there was this image of blood and a woman being cut and blood being splattered. Now, as someone who's not undergone the practice, it's one thing for me to see this image, but as someone who might be a survivor, I can't even imagine what it would be to see an image like this, you know, strewn about in mainstream media. On top of that, such visuals are more often than not accompanied by words like barbaric, ruthless, cruel, blood, all of that, which is true. But such visuals and um, uh, words have an impact on the mind of the survivor. And if the intention is to somehow help the survivor, how can we uh, shock first? Okay. Then this is uh, a headline that we all woke up to in, I think, 2016 or 17. It was on the front page of Hindustan Times. Hindustan Times is one of the leading publications in India. And this was the image. And now if you see this image closely, of course, all that you can see is the blood and the blade, but you can also see the rida and the rida is the garment that Daudi Bora women wear. And you can identify which is the community that practices it. Now, in a factual setting, that might be helpful, but in an Islamophobic country like ours, this can further um, propagate social polarization and discrimination. Okay, um, while giving some negative uh, negative examples, I also have to say that there is a lot that can be said in the same, depicting the same thoughts in a different way. You can see the image on the left-hand side has a blade, blood, black, same thing. And on the right-hand side, there is the same thing written, the cut very specifically. In fact, the H and the U make the female vulva, 
and yet it does not feel like it's triggering it's communicating the same thing but it is not triggering okay um this was a campaign that we undertook with sayo um and uh, this is again quite a graphic visual and a great case study at that because you can see there's a bl blade being placed right in the where the female genitalia is and then along with the image there is a absolutely grossly inaccurate fact during childbirth uh, a cut can cause real risk for both mother and baby this is not um type uh, india does not practice uh, is not known to practice type 3 or type 4 of hgmc uh, as far as we know there has been no complications in childbirth for a woman who might have undergone type 2 or type type 1 or type 2 okay uh, i'm going to just skip this and this is very important in the asian context um, as a filmmaker and a design student i used to venerate uh, this um, photojournalist called stephanie sinclair she actually shot uh, women uh, girls getting mutilated in indonesia but as i became a part of this movement i started to see the problem with this picture first of all when you see this picture there is a child there's a mother the child has not given any informed consent this is a horrible picture in a vulnerable moment shot without consent second of all since stephanie sinclair is such a huge name in the photojournalism world often we saw indian news media use this picture as a representation to what happens in india this is not india these are not bhoras factual pictures can also be factually incorrect um again some of the um works of stephanie sinclair where little girls are shown in uh, and these are girls probably from the indonesian context who have been shot without any form of consent all these images are highly problematic they do the job but these images are problematic because again our discourse is based on the fact that children cannot give informed consent uh, lastly again these images you would think are quite upbeat but what is the problem with this the problem is that um, well these are a uh, short these are showing the faces of the women without their consent and probably their happiest day their marriage and just because you want to be factually accurate about these are the bhoras you cannot just go to the stock photographs as happens in many in news agencies and take a picture and say okay so this is the community that practices it practices fgmc what about informed consent of someone involved in the picture um okay this this part is really crucial uh, i can't emphasize on how many as a, especially as a visualizer and how many thousand different ways we can communicate fg the prevalence of fgmc at the same time uh, be respectful about it this is one of my most favorite photo campaigns i am a bora photo campaign which in, um, involved women and men from the community uh, who say very outrightly that i am a bora and i am against khatna and what makes these images so uh, stand out for me is the fact that this shatters any kind of tribal slash barbaric or outdated um, image of the community itself so an image can do a lot more it can also build some some conscious foundations on what the community looks like what are the values they stand for at the same time a positive messaging of resistance i know shruti is probably looking at her watch right now shruti can i take one more minute yes sure <laughs> okay um like i said this is a very personal issue for me um this article uh, the two women in the rida is uh, uh, is uh, still from Uh, a pinch of uh, sorry uh, article in the outlook uh, called the yin wounded and uh, this was the first article in any form of national media that uh, spoke about the prevalence of fgmc and you can see that they have shown bhori women but at the same time they have concealed the identity and that became the foundation for me to uh, think about the visuals for a pinch of skin the image below is uh, from a, a still from pinch of skin and i think Uh, there are again a thousand different ways to imagine the community without violating anyone's personal space or right um reporting with accuracy there's so much we can unpack here but i definitely want to get arifa's voice in for a while so i'm going to stop share sharing and arifa if you can just um, show us your face and talk a little bit about fgmc hi hi everyone actually i'm uh... uh thanks so much priya that was like a very detailed and uh, important presentation and based on uh you know a lot of our experience and i'm a journalist so uh i mean i would say priya has covered most of all the important things that need to be said uh, which is uh, you know whatever she said about visuals the same thing can be applied to the words we choose to use as uh writers so you know uh, being careful about 
um not using words that can trigger a survivor or to or that can uh, you know uh, give an excuse for islamophobic people to then uh, you know uh, paint an entire community in a negative light uh, instead of focusing on one social norm because we also need to remember that all communities have harmful social norms uh, in different types of harmful social norms uh, and uh, Yes, cutting of the genitals is shocking, but we need to, as journalists, take a little more responsibility and not just have this, you know, immediate reaction of shock and then you put that into the headline. So, you know, even using terms like mutilation, like the reason we have been saying FGC uh, instead of FGM is because our, uh, as activists, like, yes, there are, there are a lot of uh, survivors who will feel that their bodies have been mutilated and that is absolutely valid. But um, as uh, activists, and therefore we also recommend to media people that when you use the term mutilation and somebody from the community reads it, their reaction is going to be, you know, I don't mutilate my daughter. Mutilation implies some kind of malicious intention to harm somebody actively. And no parent wants to actively harm their child. They are doing it not because they, you know, they want to harm their child. They're doing it because they actually have been brainwashed uh, uh, over the years through this tradition into thinking that this is a beneficial practice and this is good for their child. So it's not, um, you know, and when they read in the newspaper or, uh, you know, in a media article that uh, this is mutilation and, you know, you are a mutilator of your child, they're going to get defensive. They're not going to listen. You know, so we have to understand that human instinct and use language appropriately uh, so as not to make people feel targeted, but to invite people to listen and change their minds. Uh, so that that's what I mean by, you know, using the right terminology and also respecting what survivors say, right? So if a survivor is being quoted and she is referring to her body as being mutilated, of course, you have to use that same term. But if a survivor uses another term, you use whatever she uses. But when you're not quoting a survivor and using general language, then it is better to be a little more mindful about uh, not using uh, value-loaded or judgment-loaded terms, you know. And uh, the other thing that I would like to kind of specify, because I'm a journalist myself, and I'm also an activist, so I am, I've got my you know like one foot in each boat kind of thing so I understand the constraints of journalists also and editors who sometimes may not uh, actually retain the nuances that a journalist a reporter might have put in their report uh, so it's also important for editors to be on this table and understand this uh, you know the the issues of sensitivity around it uh, but I would recommend as journalists uh, I have seen you know a lot of survivors and community members have come uh, to me and mentioned that, you know, oh, I was misquoted. Uh, my What I said was taken out of context. And, you know, that creates a very bitter experience for community members and survivors. So it's very, very important as journalists to be responsible about playing that before a report is published, uh, you know, reach out to all the people you, uh, you know, you spoke to, play back, read their quotes back to them or send their quotes back to them. Obviously not the whole article, that's not journalistically ethical but read the whole you know just the their quotes and the context around their quotes so that they know that they're not being misquoted that the context in which they stated something is retained and uh, you know that's basic journalistic integrity uh, but we often in especially in India I, I can't speak about other Asian countries but in India we tend to uh, you know in the hurry of like meeting a deadline we tend to forget that and but you know, in, in cases of gender-based violence, it's so, and anything, it's so important to be responsible as a journalist. So that's all I want to say. I don't want to take up much more time. Thanks, Arifa. Thanks, Priya. So sorry for rushing you, but we are running against time as always. Um, thank you so much for bringing out that, um, the aspects about language. Uh, if you notice, uh, we have mentioned uh, the session to be FGM slash C because there is a difference in terminology that is used by CSOs, NGOs, collectives, and of course, survivors themselves. So one of the most important ethical parts of covering FGMC would be to understand which um, terminology they would like to be um, uh, referred to as, 
or if there are any local terms as well, which are more representative of their experiences. And as Arifa mentioned, editors have to be in the conversation. And thankfully, we have a wonderful editor uh, with us today. Danya, thank you so much for joining us. She is the editor-in-chief of the News Minute and will be speaking about a very important subject, which is how to get it done, covering sensitive subjects in tough media and cultural environments. Couldn't think of a better person to speak about it. Thank you, Danya, and over to you. Uh, you're quite, the volume is quite low. Okay. Is it better now? No? Still kind of low. Yeah, still low. Is it better now? Still, yeah, can't hear you very well. I don't know some issue with mic, but other others are okay. Okay, okay. This is great. This is great. We can hear it. So when I was uh, hi everyone, so I was uh, listening to all the speakers uh, till now. When I was invited for the webinar, I told Shruti that at the news minute we haven't covered. Uh, we have tried to cover, but we haven't because uh, at one point we did republish what Arifa uh, and Aisha Muhammad had done from Kerala. Uh, so she said that's fine. If a story comes to you, then how would you look at it? And how would you want your journalist um, to treat that story? So I'm going to speak uh, in that regard. Let us say that someone in my team wants to do a story on FGM uh, slash C. I mean, everybody has been insisting here, rightfully so, that we should use the word FGC and not FGM. So first, uh, uh, I would ask the reporter, um, who are we speaking to? Uh, do you first understand uh, what FGC is uh, and what is the cultural um, history behind it, uh, who are the communities that do it, uh, what has been the resistance from within the community and things like that. Now, once you have your history in place, you understand all this, you're read enough, who are you speaking to? Now, obviously your victims are women, could be young women, could be older women who went through this when they were young. So there are a lot of things to be uh, kept in mind. One, I would say, start with full disclosure, which is if you are, uh, you can think of a Me Too story, for example, a story about sexual harassment, uh, where the perpetrator is someone from within your family. Here too, the reason why full disclosure is needed, now when I say full disclosure, you have to tell the person that you're speaking to that you are a journalist and that the conversation that you are having is for a story and that certain parts of it or all parts of it could be used. I, when I talk to victims or survivors, I also tell them that maybe I will not do anything about it. I may not write anything. Uh, that is also a possibility because sometimes when I speak to uh, survivors or victims, I feel that putting their story out there could do more damage to them than not putting it out. Therefore, that's the call that I will eventually take with them. So I tell them that there are all these possibilities that I will either use the full interview, I may use parts of the interview, or I may not use it at all. The second thing to understand here is that when you are talking to someone who's gone to FGC, remember that the people who did it to them are their own family members, uh, are people from their own community. So it is very difficult for people to speak out then and also to understand what is the fallout of something like that. Um, for example, you can even tell a woman that I will not give any i will not give your name i will uh, mask your name or I'll, i will rename uh, give you another name or not use your picture those kind of assurances you can give and you should but sometimes that's not enough right if we are going to write that a woman who was uh, who's 30 now uh, who had to undergo fgc when she was three years old at so and so clinic in so and so place living in so and so place these are very specific details even without the name People who read from the family or community may be immediately able to understand who they're talking about. So you have to have a conversation with that person as to what is the detail that you can give and what is the detail that you cannot give. Is, is it important to quote them, not quote them? So, and the other reason why this conversation becomes very important is also because, as I said, the, the I don't think we can use the word perpetrator here, but at least the people uh, who culturally uh, subjected to them to this 
our part, our members of their family, it could be their parents or somebody else. So it puts them in a very difficult situation also when the story eventually comes out. So we have to also tell them that this is what will come out and this could be the fallout of it. I mean, I do explain to people and if they say then, then I don't want it to be written, then I tell them, okay, fine. So while talking to victims, be very careful that you have these very um, candid conversations with them and then look at what they are trying to tell you. Look at um, how that narrative becomes important to your story. If I can give you one example, there was this woman who was um, subjected to rape for many years by a spiritual guru, a Hindu spiritual guru. Um, so in her case, the guru after, you can't even call it rape because it is in the sense that if you think of violence as rape, it is not so, but it is a cult. So basically she was brainwashed into believing that he is Ra Krishna and she is Radha and that every uh, generation there will be one Radha and Krishna. Uh, so now what happens is after the act of sex, he would not allow her to take the, uh, dispose the condom because he said that the Guru's, uh, um, the Guru's condom has been disposed of in the sea because it has to meet the ocean. Basically, he was keeping the proof away. Now, when she told us this detail, she told us specifically that don't write it now, write after a few years when my case dies down. But write it sometime because people should know this is what happened. So sometimes people wouldn't want you to write it immediately. People wouldn't want you to mention details. So keep all that in mind. Be sensitive because end of the day, you are doing a story to not only tell your readers that something like this is happening, it's also very personal stories for people. So you have a responsibility to that. So this is, if you have any doubts, you can ask me um, on how I would treat the story. And, and the way I would treat the story may not be the best way, but these are just my this is suggestions coming to my mind. Now, the next thing is, I would say the easier part perhaps is to speak to victims, right? Because th there may be women who want to speak out and then you responsibly decide this is how I will cover it. This would be my imagery. Uh, this is how I will put their quotes and you send it back to them as Arefa said. Uh, and then uh, they agree with it. But the difficult part, and I think the most important part, is to fix responsibility. Now, all stories um, can simply have victim quotes and survivor quotes. And that's really the easy part of uh, the journalism there, right? You are just, uh, you're just putting out people who have suffered, uh, saying that this and this happened. I've suffered. I've had health issues. I've had, um, uh, I've had uh, psychological, emotional issues because of this. That, that is a part of the story. But I think the most important thing a journalist has to do is to fix responsibility. Now, at the lower level, the responsibility is on the clinic or the doctor or whoever was doing it. Uh, for example, we see a lot of this conversion therapy uh, basically being done for queer people, which is completely illegal in India. The Supreme Court has spoken about it many times. The Indian Medical Association has spoken about it. But there are certain loopholes using which doctors continue to do it. And I'm telling you on a daily basis, they continue to do it. Still, why are we not able to do much about it? Because we are always writing about the fact that this happens, but I feel somewhere we are not fixing the responsibility. So in stories like this, the first tier of responsibility, um, of course, lies with the clinic or the doctor who did it. Then you have to fix responsibility with the uh, association or organization for example, if it's doctors, Indian Medical Association, whoever is giving these doctors their certificates, uh, whoever is responsible for their licensing, you have to fix responsibility. That's the second tier of responsibility. The third, I would say, is with the government itself and is with the law. That why are we not able to do a lot? So you have to understand that fixing responsibility becomes a huge part of your story. That we cannot be driven by uh, victim narratives because that's a real, in fact, a colleague of mine, uh, Sudhito, says in the newsroom that that's the lowest hanging fruit uh, and perhaps the easiest thing to do. Therefore, fix responsibility. And if you cannot do that, then I would say, don't attempt the story. Because then it's not worth it, right? Then it's just uh, somebody's um, narrative and then you're not actually as a journalist saying whose job was it to ensure that it did not happen or who should have educated the community uh, who should have spoken uh, to, the, to the doctors, who should have taken action, etc. Cetera, et cetera. The last part, which is a bit tricky, is what Priya was speaking about, which is Islamophobia. So 
I may have a little bit of a different take here. Now, India has liberal governments, which is in your in many of the states, and India has a right wing majoritarian government uh, at the center. Now, as a journalist, there there are day stories which come to us daily. I, I'm just giving a comparison, uh, and which which will end up in criticizing the liberal governments, right, or the so called liberal government. I know that many times journalists go through this whole confusion as to should they criticize the liberal government so much, then wouldn't it be advantageous for the right wing majoritarian government? So a lot of journalists self censor on criticism for the right for the liberal, thinking that through their stories they are actually helping the right wing majoritarian government. I think that's a very wrong argument to have in your brain, in the sense that. when a government is liberal or claims to be liberal and progressive it is more the reason why we have to question because we have to hold them to those standards and the reason cannot be that if i question this person will the other person get an advantage it has happened unfortunately it has happened here which is why the regime changed in india because we question the previous government uh, so much for their corruption etc but we have to continue doing our jobs the same way for islamophobia now if i put the story out obviously there are going to be attacks on uh, islamic communities there are going to be questions raised about uh, conservatism there uh, that they do not give their women choices all those uncomfortable questions are going to be raised there are people who will be celebrating your story and putting it out as the example to show that look this is how this community works but at the end of the day that shouldn't stop you from finding the story the moment let's say let, let's say shuti reaches out to me tomorrow saying that danya i have this case from some place in southern india where i have got a victim like this the first thing that i should be thinking should not be if i put out the story will there be islamophobia unfortunately there will be but who is the person that i'm writing about i'm writing about that woman who has gone through this experience who shouldn't have gone through the experience that is my first concern so there should be no self censoring by any journalist or organization thinking what is the outcome of the story that's the wrong premise to start the story how can you prevent it from happening is in how you treat the story you could uh, as priya was showing in her um, in her um, presentation some of the imagery some of the words being used these are things in which you can you can definitely control the outcome but that cannot be your first concern the first concern has to be in standing with the victim or the survivor in telling their stories in holding res- people responsible in fixing responsibility then comes the next layer of how do you do it sensitively and the last part i want to say is no matter what you do no matter how sensitively you write this is a story which will be used as a marker by many people to say islamophobic stuff there is absolutely no doubt about it i mean uh, when the uh, when the hijab uh, story happened there is a state in india called karnataka where they try to ban the hijab um, one fallout of the coverage uh, ban the hijab in schools and colleges one fallout of the coverage was that people were saying but if you are supporting hijab in schools and colleges are you not against uh, uh, feminism and choice of women whether the hijab is a feminist choice or not is a discussion for later this was a discussion about whether the state can make you wear or not wear something and we cannot confuse it right but unfortunately when we report on certain things there will be discussions which are unwarranted which are not good and which are problematic that's something that you cannot stop so those are the concerns which you should not have immediately when you start on a story but the you should have those concern on how you treat the story and once you've done your job sincerely and uh, you have you have written a sensitive story just be mindful that you are not in control of the narrative anymore things may go uh, beyond your control people will say all sorts of things but unfortunately that's how things are in, our, in india at least um yeah so i'm just going to take a question i had a question about anonymous sources many publications don't prefer running stories with only anonymous sources or with people's names changed what is your experience of this and what about when there's a mix of anonymous is that more preferable fiza so this is a very difficult question and it, it depends from um, media house to media house right uh,
for example um uh, the first thing is that i don't believe in a story like fmc people media houses would mind if it's all anonymous now the reason why is because uh, if you take like a sexual harassment story where uh, harvey weinstein for example when he was taken on by uh, by the new york times they wanted a lot of people to go on record because there are a lot of legal implications of everybody being anonymous in that story right but i don't think that fmc is a uh, uh, fg fgc is a story where a lot of media publications would have any problem with all anonymous sources yes a combination of anonymous and non anonymous works but like i said uh, this is where this is a story where family ties are at stake so people may not want to speak with their name on the story because it is a lot of burden that they're taking on themselves and it is unfair on our part to insist to them that you you cannot be anonymous i need at least one non anonymous quote what i tell my journalists is that uh, let's say someone sends you a dm on twitter from an anonymous id and says this happened to me then yes we cannot work on it as long as the person is known to you and not anonymous to you right i think it's still fair to write about it everybody need not be a, a non anonymous source is my thing yeah shruti anything else i should answer uh no thank you so much uh danya for taking your time and for uh, being forthright about what the process can be thank you so much um everybody thank you uh for attending i we really really apologize um we have overshot the time but also the last session on discussion with tehmina unfortunately uh we will not be able to do because she was meeting the minister of gender uh in malaysia and she's still stuck in the meeting i'm re i really apologize for that uh and equality now sahi and kalyana mitra will look for ways of getting her back in hopefully maybe during um february 6th when it's zero tolerance day and we can speak about fgmc again thank you for your questions um thank you for staying on a little longer and of course big big thanks to all the speakers today for taking out time uh bring your insights and sharing your presentations uh i request everybody to please feel free to write to me um about any information that was shared today that you would like to access of course uh if you would like to get in touch with any of the speakers or anybody from our network which includes ngos csos um uh please let us know and also if you would like us to um be your partner in your uh, journey of covering fgmc in asia in understanding terminology in understanding trends patterns anything we are here for you um thank you so much for making this first workshop a success i'm very very happy uh time has exceeded but um i guess it's a sign of us having a lot to talk about so hopefully we'll have more platforms to speak about this and of course we hope there will be more media coverage coming out of this thank you again have a good day bye everyone bye thank you bye thank you all